At age 37, Vivek Ramaswamy has already built and sold several companies. Before he began his career as an entrepreneur, he managed to serve as the valedictorian of his 2003 senior class at Xavier High School in Cincinnati, Ohio. He was a nationally ranked junior tennis player and accomplished on the piano. Then there was a Harvard biology degree and graduation from Yale Law School. Ramaswamy has written two books, his latest, Nation of Victims, Identity Politics, The Death of Merit, and The Path Back to Excellence. Vivek Ramaswamy, let me give you a quote from your book by Greg Popovich, the coach of the San Antonio Spurs since 1996. The American experiment was always a test of whether a diverse group of people could govern themselves and be free and Many has de have decided that the results are in, and the answer to that is no. Why, why do you think? Yeah, so it's the heart of the question of our time. Can the divided democracy stand? This was the question that Alexis de Tocqueville thought about a century and a half ago. And I think one of the things we're missing today is those intermediating institutions. That's Tocqueville's description for it. These intermediary institutions outside of politics that can bridge us together across our otherwise irresolvable divide. I, I think that that's one of the things we're losing. This is actually the topic of my first book. So my first book was Woke Inc. Nation of Victims, the more recent one is the sequel. But one of the things that, one of the observations I made at the end of Woke Inc. is as every sphere of our lives becomes politicized from education to capital markets to corporate America, we lose the apolitical sanctuaries that bind us together whether we are black or white or Democrat or Republican. And that was actually one of the secret ingredients to America's success. See, see, diverse democracies are not supposed to last for centuries. They're supposed to crumble under the weight of their own divisions. But America's secret sauce was in part, for example, American capitalism. One of the great promises of American capitalism was not just that it was a great system to lift people up from poverty. I do believe it is that but it is also one of these apolitical spheres of our lives that allow us to bridge together whether or not we are of the same political tribe. And I think so one of the things that threatens the continued existence of that otherwise diverse democracy is the ever expansive force of partisan politics into every sphere of our lives, trickling down to every small nook and cranny of our culture and I think that's what creates some of those threats to the continued cohesion of our nation going forward. It's a big part of why I wrote both books, actually. Chapter one in your book, you talk about King Richard. Who is he? What is he? And why did you start with that? Well, I started with it in part because I'm a tennis fanatic. So King Richard uh, refers to uh, Richard Williams, who's the father of, of Serena and Venus Williams, of course. He's the guy who I think is the unsung hero of the success of his daughters changing the game of women's tennis as we know it today. And I've always been a Serena Williams fan and Venus Williams fan. But I, what I loved about their story was the way in which he used hardship and their experience of hardship to teach them that hardship is not the same thing as victimhood. I think that's a big part of what made them so successful is the attitude to say that, you know what, we're gonna encounter adversity but we're here to overcome that adversity. Now, the, the tale that they tell in the movie, King Richard, Will Smith plays King Richard in that in that movie. It's quite a good movie, actually, if you ask me. I, I miss good movies. We don't really get many good movies anymore, but this was one of them in, in recent years that was actually pretty darn good. The, the movie version of it showed, it was a true story, right? They said, you know, these girls grew up in Compton, difficult part of LA. At the same time, they were strengthened by the circumstances they encountered, eventually broke through and changed the game of women's tennis. Here's the part they left out, and this is what I picked up in my research, in doing my research for the book, is that actually, they actually had made enough money, their family had, to be able to move out of Compton. But Richard Williams moved them back because he, in part, wanted to know where they came from, but in part because he, know, he knew that those tougher circumstances would harden his daughters. Serena Williams is probably one of the toughest athletes to compete in human history. And to say that that wasn't part of the design that Richard Williams had in mind, I think misses an important part of the story. So, so why do I open the book with that? Well, look, I think it's a broader parable for where we are as a country, right? Is hardship the same thing as victimhood or is hardship what teaches us who we are? I think that's the choice we face as a nation today.
We were born, like the Williams sisters in Compton, as a nation of underdogs. Today, we think of ourselves as this nation of victims. We began as insurgents, but instead, as we have become these new incumbents, that incumbency has bred this new culture of victimhood. And, and I thought there was no better way to tell the story than through the, through a first personal story of, in this case, or, or a personal story in this case of, of the Williams sisters and the Williams family, the embodiment of the American dream, but a dream that in some ways we've woken up from and, and we remember what it felt like, but we forgot what that dream was all about. And I thought the best way to open the book was actually with a simple story, laying out what that dream actually was at its core. What was it like growing up in Cincinnati? Well, I grew up in Cincinnati as the kid of immigrants. So my uh, my dad came to this country in the late 1970s. My mom came in the early 80s. Uh, there there weren't a lot of people who had funny last names like mine, Ramaswamy. So people still have some trouble pronouncing it. Uh, but you know, I think it was it was edifying. I mean, you go a 50 mile radius of Cincinnati, Ohio, in any given direction, you get a cross section of the country, right? So so I'm not saying we traveled. We weren't the most, we weren't necessarily the best internationally traveled kids or even best traveled kids across the United States for much of our youth. Uh, you know, our parents were focused on you know, making sure they had a secure job, putting food on the dinner table, making sure we were academically inclined. But the funny thing is you get a good taste of the country just by driving a 50 mile radius in any given direction of Cincinnati. And you know what, I, I, uh, I had a pretty diverse range of experiences, starting in public schools, including some that weren't uh, you know, necessarily as academically inclined as my family was, but also had kids who came from much more troubled backgrounds than I did. And then at the same time, you know, I think it was a culture that didn't necessarily prioritize academic excellence. And so my parents made a difficult decision, a financially difficult decision included, but a difficult decision to send me to a private school for high school, a place where we didn't have to apologize for pursuing academic excellence, but that was a Jesuit high school and we were raised in a in a religious Hindu household. And so I always had the experience of, you know, I would say yes, my, my upbringing in Ohio, always sort of being on the outside looking in, right? As an Indian kid amongst, you know, majority black kids on the basketball court, as an Indian kid with a funny last name amongst the, uh, you know, kids whose parents and grandparents had grown up in that same community in Evendale, Ohio as the lone Hindu kid in, uh, you know, in a Jesuit high school, not knowing when you're supposed to stand up or sit down during the during the church mass. But, you know, I think each of those experiences helped shape me and got me to a place where by the time, you know, I was 18, I was more uncomfortable with being, I was more comfortable with being uncomfortable, if that makes any sense, than I was with just being comfortable in a native set of surroundings. And, and I'm really grateful to my parents for giving me that upbringing, because I think it's you know, part of what allowed me to achieve what little success I've been able to achieve since then. Well, did you see any prejudice, not about the fact that you're not white? Did you see any prejudice uh, because you were smart and ended up valedictorian of your class? I do think that there was the beginning of this anti-excellence culture that I think has now pervaded American life. It was it was born and begun to be evident in the 1990s when I was, you know, at St. X High School, for example. Um, yeah, look, is, was there all kinds of prejudice? Absolutely. And, and, and I think one of the things this informs my views today, I think that there's a lot of prejudice in America. There's a lot of prejudice throughout human history, but that's just a feature of the human condition. And I don't think it's something that we ought to necessarily flog ourselves over, because if we flog ourselves over it, I don't think we make the problem any better. And it runs in a lot of different directions. I mean, I think there were a lot of presumptions about whether or not I was supposed to be good at sports. I, I tended to be I tended to be OK, actually. I became a you know, somewhat, for my age or whatever, successful tennis player. I was a tennis fanatic, as I told you earlier. I enjoyed playing basketball at a younger age. But I think there's a little presumption about what uh, – an academic nerdy Indian guy with a funny name is supposed to do on the basketball court. You know, did that come from white kids? No, it didn't. It came from, you know, non-white kids, but of a different race. You know, I think that there were there were different prejudices, more suffered by my parents as immigrants and my dad speaking with a funny accent, the social circles that you'd run in. And I think there were implicit norms of whether or not you were included. If you're a academic high achiever at a high school and what that meant for whether or not you were, uh, you know, in the you know, whatever, in, in the in the in group or the out group of a given junior high school or high school clique. And so, you know, I think that one of the things that one of the lessons I took away from that probably stuck with me subconsciously is that I don't think that concepts like prejudice or bigotry or racism even run in a unidirectional direction, that they that that's a one way street. 
I think it's a complex plural phenomenon that runs in a lot of different directions. Most of it comes from different people actually being insecure or uncomfortable with their own grounding. And I think the more we see it with empathy, the more we see it holistically rather than through some top down narrative, I think the more likely we are to dilute it to irrelevance. Another sports figure in your book, Wilt Chamberlain. Why? <laughs> well, he was a guy who embodied excellence. Uh, so, yeah, I guess now that you're pointing it out, I did uh, I did draw from a lot of sports figures. I think part of the reason I drew from sports figures is it sort of takes the discussion about the pursuit of excellence outside of the partisan politicized context. But, you know, I think one of the analogies I make in that part of the book is that if you take somebody who's excellent at what they do, uh, you know, no matter how much you try, you're probably not going to hold them back. And so one of the things we might be better served doing is creating a culture where we don't try to hold back people from being excellent through some superimposed quality of equity, which is the new buzzword today to refer to the equality of results, be it on the basketball court or on in our classrooms or in free market capitalism. But instead to ask ourselves how each of us can be a Wilt Chamberlain in our own way, in, the own, in our own spheres of our lives, to say that there is no just one way to be excellent. I think this is a mistake that a lot of grown adults make, is thinking that you know, just because you get a job in the in the market society that just because you accumulate a bunch of green pieces of paper and you know i've had my share of success in, in doing that admittedly but to think that that's just the unidimensional axis of success that's one trap we all fall into i think our culture falls into but then that's what creates this equity driven redistributionist agenda that fetishizes green pieces of paper and i, I think the will chamberlain the example or i talk about musicians or other artists in the book as well is there's just a lot of ways to be excellent. There's a lot of ways to self-actualize, to be the best version of yourself, to discover what it is that you do well, to be able to do it passionately in a way that gives you joy, to pursue excellence. And I think that we, we'd, do, we'd be better served in helping people and creating the conditions for every individual to discover how it is they're gonna be excellent in their lives, how they're gonna achieve excellence in their lives, than we are to superimpose one vision of what it means to be excellent in America and then demand equity of results on the back end of that. And, and I think that we're falling into that trap a little bit in our culture today, but I'm not all doom and gloom about it. Uh, I think at the end of the day, if we remind ourselves of the true culture that defines the American essence, that unapologetic pursuit of, of excellence, of individual excellence, I think we can be just fine in the end. And, and I hope that this book plays a small role in in reminding people of that of that dream. How hard was it to get into Harvard and when did you decide to try it? It was actually, I think it was pretty hard as I remember. Uh, the admissions rates were, were pretty tough. Uh, I think in particular, you know, if you were an Asian American, your uh, expected SAT scores and GPAs were, you know, even on average had to be higher because Harvard had already started implementing their racial quota systems back then. Um, you know, I think it was, you know, just a broadly competitive landscape anyway. Uh, but I didn't think I was, you know, early on in high school, I didn't imagine I was going to go to Harvard. We thought we were, our family was focused on me getting a scholarship possibly to Ohio State uh, or some other school in Ohio. There were, you know, clear paths to having college be fully paid for. Uh, that was a, definitely a nice plus for our family. But I think that, you know, we, we my parents also felt that it was important to see what was out there beyond Ohio. So we took road trips. Uh, we got in the car and we drove. I and mean, we wouldn't, you know, pay money for plane tickets back then, but we would you know, hop in our uh, Toyota 4Runner and we drove to the East Coast and we did different college tours. And, you know, there was something about Harvard when I went there that struck me about the, you know, it was, it was, it was almost the kid who gave the tour guide. I still remember what he was like. He almost had like a level of self-assuredness, of confidence that, you know, obviously this is the best place, even relative to, you know, we went to Yale and Princeton and, you know, I applied and I think I got into all those schools as well, but I chose Harvard. I can't remember. Uh, no, I actually applied to Harvard early. That's what happened. Uh, and then I ended up applying to those other schools, but ended up sticking with the one that I thought there was something about that guy that was almost annoying. He was annoyingly confident, actually. He was, it was, it bordered on grading, his level of self-assuredness. Yet at the same time, it seemed to be grounded in a, a, a true conviction that he was surrounded by the best and brightest kids of his peer group on the planet. And, you know, to tell you the truth, I think there's a lot, he was probably right about that. And it was my experience at Harvard. I, you know, joined as a freshman in 2003 you get the best musicians, the best math kids, the math Olympians from, from around the world, people who are the best writers, debaters, 
hockey players, rowers, you know, you just name it. You have people who are eccentric in their own ways, but, you know, who were really exceptional at what they did, put in this concentrated environment, living, you know, door to door with one another or shoulder to shoulder with one another and three persons per dorm room. It did cultivate this culture of of pushing each of us to be the best version of ourselves. It was it was an incredible experience that I had, and it was something so different than what I had been exposed to, um, you know, in my upbringing in you know Midwestern middle class Ohio from you know kids who had come from, you know, the elite corners of of the Upper East Side of Manhattan to you know kids of foreign dignitaries to kids who came from backgrounds that were economically even more difficult than mine, but who were just excellent at what they did, be it playing the violin or be it, you know, rowing on the on the crew team. And I think that, you know, that that environment definitely uh, opened my eyes to possibilities that I didn't know that I had <laughs> it made me more ambitious. It made me uh, want to strive to to be better at things that I didn't even know that I could be good at. And, you know, I, I think part one of the things that makes me a little sad today is even I look at institutions like Harvard and Yale and I went to Yale for law school and I, it doesn't feel to me like they're the same places that they were back then. I, I think that they have become apologist institutions, institutions that have bent the knee to pushing the same social orthodoxies as nearly every other major institution. And, and to me, the biggest problem with that is it's it's almost just boring. <laughs> it's stifling. And, you know, I think that I would love to see the revival, hopefully at Harvard and Yale. And if it's not at Harvard and Yale, maybe it'll be at new universities in the next 20 years that create that culture of of unapologetically pursuing excellence, being yourself, being free to say what you want, the freedom to be wrong about it, the freedom to understand the consequences of that. And, uh, you know, and, 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 and I, I, I had the experience of doing all of those things in college and, uh, you know, definitely at a positive influence in shaping who I became. Why did you major in biology? It's a good question. I, uh, you know, if I was to do it again, I'm not sure that I would, but I, at the time I was just really passionate about the genetics revolution. I took a, I took a class in my freshman year. It was uh, called Biological Sciences 50, Genetics and Genomics. I remember it. And you know, this is on the back of the recent mapping of the human genome, the idea that there were attributes that we inherited that allowed us to become who we were, but we didn't even yet discover it, but could empirically through science. That was that was fascinating to me. It was interesting to me. It was even, I thought, philosophically rich. I mean, there were emerging bioethical questions that, uh, you know, piqued my curiosity as early as that fall of freshman year. I, I did end up writing my senior thesis on uh, bioethics matter, the creation of human animal chimeras in the lab. I actually uh, worked in the lab of a guy by the name of Doug Melton, who's one of the famous stem cell researchers at Harvard and around the world. I, I did a lot of empirical research in the lab, but ended up writing my final thesis on a, on a bioethics related topic. And, you know, I think that that was, that was interesting to me. It was the idea that we had an opportunity to know so much more about ourselves than even a century ago, human beings would have ever imagined they would have the ability to know only God would know. We would have thought a century or more ago. And so that was interesting to me. I, I think that one of the things that, um, that left me thinking twice about it, though, is that th this is a change to the structure of scientific education that I think is really important at the undergraduate level. Is I think that kids who are intellectually curious about organic chemistry or molecular biology, I think they're basically forced to spend too much time in the lab. Uh, and I think that there, that's a kind of a fetishized culture in, in the elite institutions of what it means to be scientists is to just the raw, even rote labor of working on a lab was probably too much a portion of the education relative to actually fostering curiosity about the about the underlying questions themselves. I would have weighted the education, my advice to Harvard, I don't, maybe they've acted on this in the last 20 years, I don't know, but would be to make sure, especially at the undergraduate level, to weight more towards teaching the students how to think about those scientific problems rather than conflating that with the uh, in a rather rote experience of taking liquids from one beaker and pouring it into another. Uh, you know, I think that that diluted the power of the experience a little bit, but only by a little bit. I think it was mostly a, a really positive one. You know, my one regret was in, in all that time I'd spent in the lab, I would have rather spent scratching an itch that I realized by the end of undergrad I hadn't fully scratched enough, which was some of my interest in law and political philosophy. Uh, but, you know, no, no harm, no foul. I uh, That's why I ended up 
you know, going back to law school at Yale a few years later. Um, and so I ended up scratching that itch more than fully <laughs> over those later three years. But I would say those are the reflections on my undergraduate experience. Go back <clears throat> for a moment to uh, your parents. Where were the Ramaswamis, or at least your father from and your mother, uh, where were they from in India? Yeah, both of them were from southern India. Uh, my dad was from Kerala, which is the southernmost state. Interesting fun fact about Kerala is it is a communist state. I mean, I believe still to this day, it's the communist party that's in power. That's communist in name only, though, uh, though it did have a, a strong streak, a communist sympathetic Marxist streak of sympathies. E even in the 1990s, I mean, Kerala had by far the highest literacy rates, including including women's literacy rates in India. It was like well over 90 percent, might even be close to 99 percent. I you know I don't remember the exact numbers, but impressively different than the rest of India, but it had a, you know, had a high Christian population. Uh, there's even a Jewish population in in Kerala. So it, 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 had, it was a little bit of an, a little bit of an outlier from the rest of India, a little more educated, uh, had this had this heterodox political streak to it, for better or for worse, uh, you know, had a religious diversity that I think was, I think, much more peaceable than the religious diversity in, in other parts of India. My dad was from a really small village in Kerala. It was a village by the name of Arakanjeri. It's a, it's kind of in the middle of nowhere in the boonies of India. Uh, we used to go there as kids. We used to spend, um, you know, m many parts of our summers there growing up. That was important to my dad. It could not have been more different than even Del Ohio. I don't think any of the kids that I went to school with would imagine what those summers looked like, right? I mean, you're like, I mean, just visceral stuff, right? I mean, you, there, there, there were no toilets, right? You're squatting in a hole in the ground. There's no toilet paper. You wash yourself with a bucket of water afterwards. You don't drink the water at the table. You boil it twice over, and then you drink it and still get sick half the time. You don't eat off a plate. Most of the time, you eat off a giant banana leaf with your hands. I mean, just small stuff. That's just small stuff. But I mean, think, I mean, the big stuff, you go to the temple in the morning and night, wake up at 7 a.m., do it in the evening. Uh, there's a whole ritual. I mean, it's probably two hours a day spent plus, you know, minimum two hours a day spent collectively on the on the morning and evening rituals uh, it was just it was it was just a different exposure that couldn't have been more juxtaposed with my upbringing in evendale funny thing is it was also quite a bit different than my mom's own upbringing right so she she spent a lot of her upbringing in in cities in india from mysore uh to bombay and now known as mumbai um but you know she didn't grow up in a giant extended family like my dad did in the village so in some ways that was even foreign to her um, but it was a, a diverse experience even within the family, though they both came from India uh, and though they both spoke the same language, their own upbringings, even in, in India, were quite different. And, you know, they both came to the American Midwest. I uh, you know, would joke around with my dad, why was it that you came halfway around the world of all places to Southwest Ohio? And, uh, you know, among other things, he said that his older sister had, had emigrated, uh, you know, from, uh, from India to the United States. To Fort Wayne, Indiana, and he needed to find a place that he could find a job that was within driving distance of her. So he worked at the GE plant in Evendale, Ohio. That, of course, begged the question of why she came halfway around the world to Fort Wayne, Indiana. And our uh, family joke is that it is the only U.S. state with the word India contained in the name <laughs> of the state. So that's Indiana for you. But uh, but anyway, most of his siblings ended up coming over, um, settled around Ohio, Southwest Ohio, Indiana. Kentucky, the tri-state, what we call there, the tri-state area. And uh, you know, he was one of eight siblings. And so we had a very tight upbringing with our cousins, all of whom used to transplant ourselves over the summers to India and then come back to the American Midwest for the rest of the year. Do you have brothers and sisters? I have a younger brother. Yeah, he's four years younger to the day, actually. So what is the difference between living in a Hindu family and then also going to a Jesuit high school? You see both the Catholic side, the Hindu side. How do people think differently in those different groups? Yeah, I think um, it's a good question. It was one that my dad paused at before sending us there. I mean, the Hindu part of our identity was really important to him. I think that the differences were fewer than you might expect. And I think that was probably my biggest discovery was that there's, there's, I think, a basic human need. Um, I think it's psychologically hardwired in us, maybe even, you know, for, for, for the secular crowd here, uh, evolutionarily hardwired human psychological need to believe in something greater than yourself, to believe in something higher. And you know, I think that when we lose our ability to believe in something higher in the conventional sense through faith and God or whatever, you know, we relocate that impulse to other higher powers instead. And sometimes 
that can be our politics. Sometimes that can be group identity. Sometimes that can be, you know, other postmodern secular religions that we fail to recognize as religions. But anyway, I think that one of the things that, uh, you know, Hinduism and Catholicism both offer are time tested models to offer you a way to believe in something, you know, higher and more important and bigger than yourself. I think humility is a is a fundamental value in both Catholicism and in in Hinduism. I mean, I think, you know, in Catholicism, you you don't think of yourself as God. You don't worship an idol, but one of those idols can be your own ego, right? I think the lack of idol worship, that that, that would seem to be one of the differences, right? Because Hindus go to temples and you supposedly worship idols. Actually, it's, that's, that's a myth that that's a difference because it's no more than you go to church and you bend your knee at the church. Those are just symbols of acknowledging that you are you are just a part of a broader whole that preceded you and that will succeed you, that will was here long before you showed up and will be here long after you are gone. And, you know, I think that, you know, there was my introduction to quantum physics. I felt like it wasn't the first time that I learned it. I think it was, in a certain sense, part of a Hindu upbringing. The fact that, you know, you are part of the matter of the universe that comes into existence but returns back to that broader matter, and that's Hinduism in a nutshell. You know, I think our modern understanding of physics isn't that different than I think uh, Hindus' understanding of Hindu theology, which in turn isn't that different from from I think many uh, from a Jesuit understanding of the relationship between oneself and God at its core. Now, you know, you know, are there are there differences? You know, in the belief about the the resurrection of Christ and exactly which story and how it happened and and Book of Genesis and whether it was created in seven days. You know, whatever. And we we yeah yes, of course, each religion is distinctive and different for a reason. But what stood out for me was a the ability to empathetically step into the shoes of, of you know my classmates, most of whom had gone to Catholic school from first through eighth grade anyway, and to be able to learn a new religion as a foreigner, but to realize actually by the end of it it wasn't that foreign at all. It was something that you know I, I didn't feel like I read the Bible for the first time, or at least many parts of it. There was no first time. There were parts of it that were even familiar from my own upbringing though we had technically never read the Bible in many ways, uh, you know, it felt like a familiar text. So I, I think that was kind of my biggest takeaway from it is that the bigger divide, you know, from a religious perspective today, I think is not between, you know, the Hindu and the Catholic and the Jew or the Muslim or whatever, but between, uh, you know, I think those who believe in the humility of a higher power and their relationship to God and, what that means for their willingness to forgive their fellow fallible human beings, recognizing the ways in which each of us are fallible in our own right. I think recognition of our own fallibility is what leads us to forgiveness. Forgiveness is actually a core theme of the book, you probably noticed, but I think that that's actually the bigger divide is between the people who lack that humility because they were never introduced to or never had the ability to uh, you know, fully express their belief in God as a higher power and the people who don't. That's a much more meaningful divide than the divide between, I think, people who are, you know, devoted members of different religious faiths. How many young people today, <clears throat> excuse me, do you think would know who Horatio Alger was? I ask it, obviously, because you mentioned him more than once. Mm -hmm. Not many, I think, is the answer. I think they may not know who Horatio Alger was. I think even more worryingly, they don't know about the American dream that Horatio Alger wrote about. And you know, I joke in the book that the way that we might get people to pay attention to Horatio Alger's stories today is by reminding them that he was gay. And you know, we live in a moment where if you affix a certain label to someone, then that might be a wake-up call to get someone to pay attention to them. And so that was my attempt in the book to say, okay, if you don't care about what he had to say, uh, but you care about superficial skin deep identities, then hey, let me remind you of one of those. Hey, here's a gay author that we've forgotten and canceled. Maybe that'll wake up a generation of, of Gen Z and millennial readers to pick up his books again. But you know, I think that the reason why is that we've we've forgotten that dream, the idea that no matter who you are, or where you came from, that you can achieve anything you ever want with your own hard work, your own commitment, your own dedication. That's the American dream. That's the Horatio Alger story. And we're not a nation that tells Horatio Alger stories anymore. I, I think it's less important that we remember him particularly than we remember the character of the stories that he told. That's the, those are the stories of our country. Those are the stories of our national identity. Those are the stories of who we are as a people. Those are the stories of who we are as individuals, as Americans. And I think that we need to remind ourselves of that story once again, our national story 
the story of what it means to be an American. I think we lack a good answer to the question of what it means to be an American in the year 2022. And one of the things I hope to do is to fill that void with an affirmative answer, not just critiquing the uh, the bad answers we sometimes get, that it's your, your skin color or your gender or your sexual orientation or your political party affiliation or whatever it might be, but to fill that identity with the Horatio Alger inspired vision that you're an agent, a, a free agent, an autonomous agent in the world who can achieve anything you ever want with your own dedication, your own free will. Yes, that's part of what it means to be a human agent. It's part of what it means to be an American. And you know, I hope we can remember that again, whether or not we call it a Horatio Alger story. Those are the stories we need to revive. Not a bad thing that the sun sets on the American empire. Really? Well, I, d I don't know that I, I want to see the sun set on the American <laughs> empire, but I think the use of the word empire, I think, is uh, there's many ways in which we can use that word. That's why I sort of draw the analogy to the Roman empire. I, I think that one of the things we, we might learn more about America by looking at it from the outside in, from looking at an empire from a different part of the world. We might learn more about our present moment from departing from the present moment and, and taking a tour through history and remind us of, of our travails being not something that was so foreign, but might actually be more familiar than we know. You know, I think that one of the analogies you hear today, speaking of uh, San Antonio Spurs coach Greg Popovich, is, you know, one of the things he said was that sometimes he worries that we're Rome. Uh, referring to the decline of the American experiment and analogizing that to the fall of Rome. But one of the things I did in, in this book was in preparing to write it and the research I did for the book, it reminded me actually that there actually wasn't one rise and one fall of Rome. There were many rises and there were many falls. And I think so too, it is true for the American experiment as well. There have been many rises and there have been many falls. And, and I think that that's, I, I at least find that heartening. I find it inspiring to say that, you know, it's not like we're in one unidirectional slide of the American experiment. We might be at a local nadir. I acknowledge that. I think many of our fellow Americans would too. But that doesn't mean it's the end of the road. It means that it might be one of those moments where we look in the mirror and ask ourselves who we are and rediscover who we are. And so you know, I think the Roman Empire had many of those rises and falls. It's part of why I tell the story of the Punic Wars, the wars between, let's say, Rome and Carthage. I think it's a good reminder, speaking of humility, uh, we talked about it in the individual context of individual humility. I think we owe it to ourselves to have some national humility too. You know, Popovich didn't mean it flatteringly, says where he says, sometimes I, I wonder if we are Rome. One of the questions I ask in the book is whether we should be so lucky as to be Rome. Rome and the Roman Empire, depending on how you measured it, lasted in time scales measured not in even decades or centuries, but in millennia or in, in, in over a thousand years. We haven't gotten there yet. We might be sooner asking ourselves, well, not, not the question of whether we are Rome, but whether we are Carthage. And by the way, whether Taiwan might be our Sicily, that's a separate geopolitical question we can get into. But, uh, you know, I think that's why I think the tour through history was useful. In one sense, we might worry that we're Rome, that we may be falling when in fact, there's not one, one fall where there's many rises and many falls of Rome and of America. So that's the good part. The bad part is that we should be so lucky as to be Rome. We might actually be Carthage, but we talk a lot you know, I think even, uh, you know, a lot of Americans today like to talk about the importance of learning our history. And sometimes I even fall into this trap, talk about learning our history. But rather than using the book to preach about how important it is to learn our history, I devoted some of that airtime to reminding ourselves of that history itself, post-Civil post War Reconstruction history in the United States, untold or unremembered stories in the, in the rises and falls of the Roman Empire. And then we come back to the American empire and say that, you know what, even the analogy of whether the sun is setting on the American empire might be an inapt analogy. The question is actually not whether the sun sets, but maybe if the sun sets, we remember that it rises just another 12 hours later. But what do we learn in the meantime as we go to sleep and wake up? You know, we, we might remind ourselves of the dream that inspires us, the American dream that inspires us by the time the next time that sun rises. And so, you know, that was, I think, part of my goal in the book in going through history is not to, you know, this is not a history book. But there is a lot of history in the book. And I hope that it teaches us not something just about history, but teaches us something about the present. I think that's probably the number one point of studying history at all. Without getting too nosy, you're 37 years old. Could you live the rest of your life without ever having to make another dollar? I could, yep. I would uh, easily, uh, that's, that's what I thought I was gonna do. Actually, I did start another business this year, but 
that was to uh, address a market need that I saw. But yeah, I, uh, I'm fortunate to not have to worry about putting food on the dinner table and probably uh, for, for my kids to never have to worry about putting food on the dinner table either. And you know, I think that's part of what motivates me to speak as freely as I have, because I do think that there are many Americans who do today have to make that choice, have to choose between the First Amendment and the American dream, if you will, you know, speaking their minds freely and putting food on the dinner table. If I've enjoyed as much success as I have uh, through the upbringing and education that I was given by my parents, through the you know fortunate circumstances I have to be born in this country rather than a different one, then you know I felt like it was part of my civic obligation to at least use that to hopefully speak in an unabashed and unrestricted way. Um, but you know that's part of why I'm doing what I'm doing. Go back to the very beginning of when you started to build your first business. How'd you do it? Well, so uh, the the first business was actually a um, a small one. <laughs> uh, it's not the one that most people know about. I actually built a small company in college with a co-founder that was designed to help other young entrepreneurs. Now, keep in mind, this is after Mark Zuckerberg. He was a year ahead of me at Harvard, had you know massive success with Facebook. There was a, a, a boom of youth entrepreneurship you know, on Harvard's campus and elsewhere. And so my uh, co-founder, Travis May, and I set up a business that created an online platform that helped young, funder, young founders connect with sources of capital and through other services on the internet, through an internet platform. That model since became popularized by others. It was acquired for, you know, what was a small sum of money in the scheme of things, a, a big sum of money to us at the time. But that was my first, that was the first business. Uh, it was called Campus Venture Network. That uh, it's probably probably the one business that I've started that no one knows about because uh, because we did it at the age of uh, twenty two. How did you start it though? Go back to <clears throat> go back to how literally what was your first step? Well, my first step was actually I was on a bus in China uh, with uh, with the guy who ended up becoming my co-founder. We were both part of the Harvard College in Asia program, and one of the themes of that spring was how do uh, you know how would universities spur more youth entrepreneurship? And we thought this was a a trend we were going to see in the American economy and, and possibly the global economy. We were there in China. We were seeing the same boom there as well. We spent that spring break at uh, at Beida at Peking University. Uh, that is you know, sort of the Harvard of China, if you will. And there was a similar trend there. And so the bet we were making was that and it's, it's one that's played out was that entrepreneurs weren't just going to be people who were older that were industry experts in a given industry that worked their way up the ranks and then left and had an investor uh, in the form of their former boss that would then fund them to start a business. Entrepreneurs were going to be young people who were looking at industries from the as outsiders, from the outside in, but that they weren't necessarily equipped to have ready-made funding available to them. This is before the venture capital boom that we've seen in the 20 years since. And so, you know, there, there was a trend we saw. There was a need in the marketplace. And ironically, it was an idea to say that we could be entrepreneurs that capitalized on actually the trend of entrepreneurship itself. So that was the first business, and, and I learned a lot from it. You know, it, it it didn't end up you know nearly as big as as we you know hoped and dreamed that it was going to be like the next Facebook or something like that. But it was it was something of a success. Uh, you know, we 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 built it. It was revenue generating business. Built a a great and growing team. Had an acquirer that uh, that allowed us all to you know pocket some pocket some nice uh, you know change out of the out of that transaction. But that's kind of what got my feet wet in entrepreneurship. And then the first you know I would say substantial business that I started was actually a biotech company that built on my bioscience background uh, from you know the, my undergrad years. I had become a biotech investor uh, after I graduated from college. I saw some industry failures in the biotech industry that, that bothered me. I mean, they got under my skin, actually. The ways in which, you know, if you were a scientist at, at a big company like Pfizer or GSK or whatever, if you took a risk and you succeeded at delivering a blockbuster drug, you weren't really participating personally in any of that upside. But if you took that same risk and you failed, somehow that was actually going to you know, result in job security risk for you. And so what did that create? It created an entire culture where people didn't take those risks. It created a bureaucratic managerial culture of mediocrity. And so, so the business I started, Royvent, in 2014 was designed to buck that trend to say that, hey, there's a bunch of drugs that these big pharma companies weren't developing because of institutional bias, but which had strong rationale behind them. Great, we could in-license them from those companies and develop them. 
But we could also do it by hiring scientists and drug developers who would get skin in the game, upside in the projects they actually worked on that incentivized them to take those risks in a way that wasn't true at the time in big pharma. And so, you know, Royvent, um, you know, bucked an industry trend. Uh, you know, it, it did the thing that we noticed <laughs> I was talking about earlier as an entrepreneur, younger, younger entrepreneurs in my late 20s that started this biopharmaceutical company. And, uh, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of what it accomplished in the seven years thereafter. Uh, it's actually almost been nine years now, but seven years that I led it for CEO after founding the company in 2014. And, you know, we got a number of medicines that we developed that ended up becoming FDA approved products. I think five of them, in fact. Uh, Royvent itself is a multi-billion dollar company today. Uh, its spin-offs have, have had success um, as well. And so, you know, I was that was my first experience in having, I would say, larger scale impact as an entrepreneur. What what does the name Royvent mean? Ah, yeah, it was a uh, <laughs> it was a double entendre. So so the ROI referred to return on investment and the Vant referred to advantage. So the advantage of unlocking the return on investment in drug development by aligning these incentives in the way that I described. Uh, but then it was also a holding company, right? So with subsidiary companies, the, why, why was that the structure? Because the whole point was to give those scientists and drug developers equity in their projects. And so each of those little units, those pods were called Vants. Uh, and so those were like the children company, but the parent company uh, was was Royvent. So it was, a, it was a double entendre on the French word Roi. So it's like sort of the, the king, the parent of, of uh, the children companies that we formed. And over the time I led the company, I think there were 20 of those children companies that we formed underneath the umbrella. But that was where the, uh, the name came from. Any idea how many millionaires were made out of your company? Oh, that's a great question. Um, a lot is the answer. Um, but I don't, uh, but I, I'd have to give you, I'd have to get back to you on an exact number. I haven't tabulated that statistic. But broadly speaking, I am, you know, I'm proud of, I'm proud of, I'm probably most proud of the fact that this <laughs> should not surprise you, I guess, as a biotech entrepreneur of, of the medicines that we developed and the impact they're having on patients. But there was definitely a big side effect of, of creating, you know, I think life changing wealth for, uh, you know, the people who were part of that journey and the people who played critical roles in getting those drugs developed too. Tell and, us, uh, tell that's us that's something we're proud of. Yeah. Tell us a couple of those drugs. What do they do? Yeah. So, um, so I actually start with the story. I think it's actually important to start with one that failed. Right. It was it was actually a drug that failed early in life. And I'll tell you about some of them that, that are that are that are approved drugs today. So the one, one of the first drugs I worked on was a drug for Alzheimer's disease that we thought had promise, but knew it was a risk. There's no certainty that it's going to work. In fact, most drugs for Alzheimer's fail. We did the whole phase three study. We flipped the cards. It didn't work. So that was actually one of the early experiences that also taught us that said, you know what? That's what drug development's all about. The whole point is to have a portfolio of drugs and, and, and have a number that end up going on and succeeding. And so we focused on other areas like Alzheimer's disease that were under addressed by other big pharma companies. You know, one of the big areas we ended up focusing on was women's health conditions. There was there's a, uh, you know, drug that we you know put into the late stages of development that was designed to treat endometriosis and uterine fibroids. And if it was delivered in a different way at a different dose, it was also uh, eligible as a potential drug to treat prostate cancer for men. So that was a bit, you know, interesting, right? It runs the whole spectrum. You know, when it was treating women, you had to, it was, it's complicated, but you, you know, at a different dose with a different, at, at, with a different combination therapy. But if you give it as a monotherapy at a higher dose, it, it appeared to be an eligible drug to treat prostate cancer. All three of those indications are approved indications for that drug today, FDA approved. And there was another drug we developed in an area that wasn't very sexy for big pharma, but that afflicts a lot of older people, overactive bladder. You know, I, I learned a lot about through my development of drug for Alzheimer's disease about the unmet needs that patients have from nursing homes to living in their own homes for of overactive bladder. And, and that's a big problem amongst elderly Americans. And a lot of the drugs that were used to treat it had undesirable side effects for those patients, you know, and, and, you know, without going into the biology of it, let's just say that was, that was an unaddressed problem. So we put a drug into development for overactive bladder into phase three development that ended up becoming an approved drug thereafter as well. Uh, there was uh, actually one, one therapy that we worked on in collaboration with Duke university that nobody else seemed interested in working on. Why? Well, because there's 
there was fewer than 20 kids a year who were born with this genetic condition. And the sad part about it was that it's a uniformly fatal condition, actually. 100% of kids, if left untreated, would die before the age of three with that disease. It was devastating genetic disease, but there's only 20 of them, which made it not an area that was particularly sexy, again, for the rest of pharma to focus on. We said that's exactly the kind of area where we could have a differential impact. And so that was an area where we partnered with Duke to take that therapy that they had pioneered to take that over, you know, over the drug development process and eventually did, did end up crossing the FDA approval finish line. Uh, you know, Royvent, you know, so some of those drugs were, were uh, partnered or I should say divested in a transaction with a large uh, Japanese pharmaceutical company. There was another drug that Royvent went on to develop on its own, which is a, a drug for the treatment of psoriasis a uh, an fda approved product today as well and you know i think one of the things that i think everyone who works at royvent is proud of is to say that we looked at dr developing drugs in areas where other people were too timid to develop those drugs or that they were areas that were not important enough for the institutional or managerial class in conventional pharma and you know what we said is if we can make a difference and build a business around it we would do it with pride and with dignity and you know i think at the end of the day with success as well. And so, uh, you know, I'm, I, I learned a lot during those seven years. I'm incredibly grateful to, to, you know, my colleagues and partners who taught me a lot, but that was a phase of my career that I hung the jersey on in early 2021 when I said that, uh, you know, I was done with my biotech uh, CEO career and was going to move on to a different phase, scratching that itch at the intersection of law and political philosophy that we talked about earlier. Uh, offering my perspectives on what I saw as a new problematic trend. Uh, I would go so far as to call it a new cancer, not a biological cancer, but a cultural cancer that I felt threatened both capitalism and democracy, which was this new rise of politicized capitalism that I felt was going to be bad both for democracy and for the private sector and our economy. And that's what led me to the next phase of my journey, starting with writing the, the pair of books that I did, Woke Inc. and Nation of Victims. Earlier, you talked about humility, and I want to go through three or four things about you. You were the valedictorian in your high school class. You went to Harvard. You went to Yale Law School. You, I'll, do, I'll say this. You don't have to quarrel with this. You've made millions since you've been in the business world. How in the world can somebody 37 years old remain humble? You know, I think... Um I've also failed a lot at a lot of things I've done along the way. Uh, I, I mean, it's not as a joke. It's actually a true story. I, I, uh, I had a short-lived career as a stand-up comedian uh, before, after law school and before I started my biotech company. Boy, was that hard. <laughs> I, thought, I thought that would be fun to do. Uh, that was humbling. Uh, you know, I mean, the, the development of the Alzheimer's drug, that was, I mean, that was a colossal humbling. I mean, my face had been on the cover of Forbes magazine not long before that drug ended up failing. I mean, that felt... Uh, you know, for me at the time, it, it was ego bruising, but I think it's good to have your ego bruised uh, once in a while. And so one of the things I, I try to keep doing is is pushing myself to, you know, for, for two reasons. I think one is pushing myself to do things where I'm not automatically set up for success. Someone could argue that I'm set up for failure. I mean, even the new business I've started, Strive. I mean, it's a, it's a many people would say, too daunting of an undertaking to to, you know, take a look at this industry of passive asset management and proxy voting, it's too big of a mountain to climb. I believe in daring to do things that you're not supposed to do. And I think that there's two reasons why. One is that it's a great way to stay humble. You can coddle yourself just by setting yourself up for success and then succeeding at the achievable. One of the things about going after the unachievable is that certain number of times you're destined to fail and that failure is going to teach you more than your successes do. And one of those things that's going to teach you is humility. I think the second reason why is that sometimes you might actually just manage to do it. And I think that that makes some of those things worth doing as well. And so I think it's this, you know, it's this unique tension between audacity and humility. I don't view those as opposites. I actually view them as complementary. They're two sides of the same coin. They go together. I think you can't quite be, uh, I, at least I can't be humble without being audacious, uh, but I couldn't be successful in being audacious without that humility as well. And, um, you know, I, I think every time do I sort of let it get to my head once in a while? Sure, I do. Uh, it's hard not to, um, but I think do I pretty quickly get smacked down 
by uh, failure and experience. Uh, yes, I do. That happens pretty frequently. Uh, not least of which comes from some of my family members, my wife included. You know, I think it's important, and, and my friends included. Uh, and so I think it's important. One of the things I'm most grateful for is surrounding myself with people who will honestly, unabashedly, and in an unvarnished way uh, tell me when uh, when anything when it's getting to my head and, and put me back in my place as I should be. <laughs> and and uh, yeah, I, I have to also say that I think um, leaving New York City uh, years ago at this point was uh, was good ahead of having kids. We decided we don't want to lay, raise our kids in Manhattan. So in 2019, we left New York and moved back to Ohio where we're raising our two kids now. Uh, both of them have since been born. And, you know, that was, I think, a, uh, I think that was, that, I mean, having kids was humbling. Having kids was part of what keeps us humble. I mean, that's, there's so much of that that's not in your control, right? You just seed your, the most important thing in your life to a higher power and to, you know, to, to destiny to determine for you, you know, who your kids are and what, what God gives you. And I think that there's nothing that makes you more humble than having to surrender yourself to, you know, the fact that, you know, are you, are you even going to be blessed with children? What, what are they, what are, they, what are they going to be healthy? Are they going to be, you know, are they going to be, uh, you know, agents in the world that are able to forge their own way. That's not something that anyone who's had kids will tell you. We're learning it now too. That's not something you control. It's something you can guide. It's something that you can, uh, you know, create the conditions that allow them to thrive. But that's about it. If that doesn't teach you humility, I don't know what does. But I think you know, leaving New York City, coming to Ohio to raise those to raise our kids, um, you know, I think has been you know part of what allows us to not get wrapped up in the you know, world of, of elite land all the time as well. Where'd you meet your wife? Uh, we met, uh, we met in elite land. <laughs> we met at Yale. Uh, you know, I think uh, she was my next door neighbor. She was uh, in med school. I was in law school. Actually, we lived in the same building by coincidence. Uh, we're both vegetarian. That was a big part of why I think our, one of our first, our first date actually was at the vegetarian restaurant right across the street from that apartment building where I used to get most of my meals. Uh, Claire's in uh, in New Haven on College Street. So that was uh, that was how my wife and I we actually met at a party, but we ended up discovering we lived uh, almost right next to each other in the same apartment building, and um, yeah, pretty immediately hit it off. And it wasn't long before we knew that that was where that was where the story was gonna you know that was where the story was gonna go. Was there a book in your life early that made a big impact on you? Yeah, I think um, I wouldn't say it was one. It was it's kind of going back to the earlier conversation. So there's a, there's an ancient Hindu text called the Mahabharata, which tells sort of the ancient legend of a family of kings and, and sort of the dynastic struggle between two wings of the family who, who struggle over their historic kingdom. Uh, and I think reading that book uh, growing up and then reading the Bible, actually, when I was in in high school, as I said, as a non-Catholic kid at the Catholic school, I think the juxtaposition of the two definitely um, definitely influenced me in a big way to understand that the you know the struggles that we go through as individuals, um, you know, our, our hunger for purpose and meaning and identity that feel so unique in the to us in the moments that we're going through them uh, are not at all unique. <laughs> in fact, this is the story of the human condition uh, and the story of the human experience, whether in the Hindu tradition or in the Judeo-Christian one. And, uh, you know, I think I think the ability to be an adolescent who was going through, you know, your own struggles and search for identity and meaning and purpose to be able to read about the great iconic stories in, in my own cultural tradition, but that of, a you know, what we would felt like a different cultural tradition at the same time. You know, I think those were uh, those are probably the two books. I mean, <laughs> they're iconic historical books in in each religious tradition. Uh, but you know, it's, it probably had more of an impact on me than anything else. I want you to close our discussion out by telling the lawnmower dispute. Mm. Yeah, I think uh, it even hurts a little bit as you ask about it. Um, so, um, so we're visiting a family member. This is uh, long after I'd graduated from college, started my business had achieved some, you know, whatever success was busy, um, you know, had had a little bit of New York that had rubbed off on me at the time too. But we came back to visit my family members and uh, we were, you know, at the house in the American Midwest. Uh, we were pulling into the driveway 
and my uh, you know my older family members who you know were immigrants they were taught to keep their head down to not uh, speak up and speak out were a little bit annoyed that there was a new neighbor that had moved into the house next to them who mowed the lawn and covers their their driveway and lawn when just as easily the guy could mow the lawn the other way just like the everyone in their street did such that the excess grass landed on their own driveway just like our old neighbor used to do as well and, and you know by coincidence the next morning the neighbor was indeed mowing his lawn and it had indeed spilled on to my family members driveway and so i uh did what they as you know quiet put your head down and and don't make a make a ruckus kind of immigrant mentality with their mentality wouldn't do i i i approached him i you know thought in in a civil way uh waved him over and asked him a question i said hey would you uh you know would you mind mowing your lawn in the other direction so it doesn't spill over lawn onto my driveway of my family's house uh, he didn't like the fact that i asked him that question uh we had made some i tried to make some small talk beforehand i said hey you know did you move in you know is he looked young he looked about my age i said you know do you live here he didn't seem to seem to like me asking him those questions and he definitely didn't like it when i asked him about the lawn and uh and so this is you know keep in mind this is in you know the american midwest today and so he he uh effectively puts his hand in my face turns around and starts walking in the other direction as though it was just to say you know shut up and i'm going to go back to doing what i was doing without changing my behavior so as he's walking away, I said that, look, I think that if we need to settle this dispute in another way, we can do that, referring to, you know, thinking of a homeowners association or whatever. This is a classic kind of question. Now, he um, took offense to that comment and he, you know, he charged at me. He looked me in the face and he said that, uh, you know, the, the, you know, he's used some epithets and he ended his comment by saying that uh, your don't don't you forget that your skin color is three shades darker than mine and if i need to go in and get my gun and end this bleep uh, then i'm going to do that at which point i decided i did not want to escalate this dispute further so i said nothing further and he went on with his day now uh that was a pretty jarring event for me but here's the detail that uh, that matters and makes a difference to some people. Most of the time when I tell that story, people assume that he was white. He was actually black, uh, three shades lighter than me, as he noted, but he was black nonetheless. And that story, it stuck with me because it was a misunderstanding at its core. What he saw was someone you know, asserting a microaggression against him for his race, prejudicially judging him. What he saw as a as a suggestion to go to the homeowners association was a threat to use police power against him, which, you know, through I don't know what experiences he or, or others may in his life may have had, but that was very different from what I intended. But the wake up call to me was to say that, you know, could I have been a little bit more polite about it? Sure. But it was also a wake-up call to say that we live in a moment where I had to see him not as my family member's neighbor, but as my family member's black neighbor. And that was fundamentally different from what we were taught growing up, to say that you don't have to anticipate something about someone's thoughts or experiences based on the color of their skin, that you could just see them as who they were. And the irony was, as, as he noted, that funniest part of the story, if there's a funny part of the story at all, is that I didn't even know he was black until he identified himself as such to me he actually looked like uh, look, looked you know not uh, not much you know, wider than you look on this screen to me but that that was clearly the lens through which he saw it and you know there was there was somewhat of a happy ending to the story i heard you know a couple of years later uh, i think his uh, I, I guess it was his wife that talked to some of my, the family members who i was visiting and you know sort of uh, apologized and made amends for the incident saying that she had talked to some of the other neighbors in the neighborhood by the way many of whom are black uh, both neighbors on the other side were black, apparently. And, uh, you know, I think uh, un, un, who had lived there for years as well. This was a new family that had moved in relatively more recently. So said that, look, they had heard great things and that there was some great misunderstanding and it was all mended over. But it it awoke me to the fact that 
the culture we live in today, when two neighbors look at each other and the things they're supposed to see in one another are so filtered through the prisms of race and the other genetic factors we inherit that it sent me on that journey to to ask the question of how it was that we got here. But, you know, however it was that we got here, the path from this victimhood ridden culture bath back back to a path towards the shared pursuit of excellence. That's a hard that's a hard 180 turn. And, you know, one of the one of the cases I make in the book is the path from victimhood back to excellence runs through an uncomfortable place. It runs through forgiveness. And and I think that, you know, I, I haven't yet gone back and, you know, knocked on that neighbor's door and uh, invited him out for a drink. We probably wouldn't talk about the incident, but maybe we'd go catch a game, you know, maybe do it over a bite or a beer and, you know, we'd move on. And, uh, you know, I haven't been able to bring myself to do that yet. I, you know, I, I haven't gone back, but even when I do go back and visit, I haven't yet done that. And uh, that's something I want to do. <laughs> and I managed to write managed to write this whole book, even a book where I devote part of a chapter to tell this story sooner than I've been actually able to, uh, you know, to, to, to ask the guy out for a drink and, and see if we can't, you know, have a, have a nice evening, you know, out over a bite or a drink. I think that's more, more what we're going to have to see in our culture, though, is a culture that may not get to the bottom of all of our disagreements and disputes, but may have a better chance of just finding a way to acknowledge them and then to move on. And, uh, you know, I think that's the last best hope we probably have as a country right now. It's the last best hope we have in any relationship. I think if, if, if I, don't, I don't know if, are, are you married? Are you, are you I am. married? Right? Okay. Yeah. So, so you're probably, I'm married too. I, you probably know this. You're probably not going to get to the bottom of resolving every last dispute. You know, the best you're going to do is to call it a day and move on. And I think that in some ways we as citizens are all in a co-equal relationship with one another too. It's not a marital relationship, but it's a different kind of sacred relationship that we share with one another as co-equal citizens. And I think one of the things we're going to have to all get better at, myself included in that, is by uh, being able to say to our fellow citizens that we're not going to agree on everything, but we're going to lay down our arms and and uh, and move on together because there's still more that we care about preserving in our co-equal relationship than the fewer things that we might disagree even vehemently about. For the last hour plus, we've been talking to Vivek Ramaswamy from Columbus, Ohio. His book is called Nation of Victims, and it's his second book. And we thank you very much for uh, joining us today. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to the Book Notes Plus podcast. Please rate and review Book Notes Plus, and don't forget to follow so you never miss an episode. Questions or comments, we would love to hear from you. You can email us at podcasts at c-span.org.